the Holy Gospel according to St. John, the third chapter. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. Nicodemus came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. And Jesus answered Nicodemus, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to Jesus, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. For what is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished then that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus said to Jesus, How can these things be? And Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to that which we have seen, and yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into the heavens except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that God gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. God invites us to live a life of grace. God invites us to live a life of grace, not only in the church, but also in the world. When it comes to spiritual realities, we often are a lot like Nicodemus. We are puzzled. We just don't get it. We do not understand. In fact, most Christian reality is counterintuitive to human logic. Thinking personality types like Nicodemus generally don't get it. Feeling personality types like the Samaritan woman who is in the next chapter usually are more open to Jesus and to his message that God is a loving being. Even so, Jesus was amazed at political ruler and professor Nicodemus because he did not understand the need for a new spiritual birth and the method of the new spiritual birth. Nicodemus, whose name means ruler of the people, is like other seekers in John's gospel. He was impressed with Jesus' miracles. He might have been impressed, for example, with uh, how Jesus turned the water into wine at the wedding feast in Cana. You see, Nicodemus has a kind of signs faith. No one can do these signs, G Nicodemus says to Jesus, apart from God. Nicodemus has then a signs faith. But in the fourth gospel, signs faith is not an adequate Christian faith. It is not an adequate Christian faith or because it is not a faith in our trust in God's special person, Jesus, who can save us from our sins and restore us to God. It is not a grace faith. It is not an adequate faith for the kind of spiritual living in the world that God wants us to practice. So Jesus jumped right to the point with Nicodemus. Nicodemus, he said, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born again or born from above. And Jesus tells Nicodemus this truth in this passage, not once, not twice, but three times. You must be born, he said, from above or born of the Spirit of God. So now Nicodemus misunderstands Jesus' words by interpreting them in a concrete, physical way 
as a second birth from his mother's womb instead of a spiritual birth, a second birth from God's womb. Jesus' response picks up the idea of water breaking before a baby is born. Entrance into the kingdom of God, says Jesus, will require a double birth, a physical fleshly water birth and a spiritual wind new birth. I tell you, says Jesus, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and of the spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Now notice please that Jesus did not say to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you must change yourself. No, he said rather, you must be born anew, referring to God's work in an individual. Conversion or new birth is the work of the grace of God. It is not the work of human beings, whether those human beings are evangelists or people being converted. God is the great change agent, not human beings. One cannot be a little bit born of God any more than one can be a little bit pregnant. What Jesus is speaking of is an event and a process that either has happened or has not happened in a person's life. One either has a Christ child, so to speak, growing inside and expressing itself on the outside in terms of God's love and grace, or one does not have a Christ child growing inside of them and expressing it in practice. How then can this be? That is Nick's question, and that is our question. And Jesus responded with the great summary verse of the Christian gospel, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that God gave God's only son so that every person who believes in or trusts one's life to the son might not perish but have, present tense, eternal life, life of the age to come. And notice, please, what the text does not say. The text does not say that God so loved the church that God gave the only son. The text does not say that God so loved the synagogue or the people of God that God gave the only son. No, the text says that God so loved the world. And the world here is those human beings who are in an enemy relationship with God. The world here is people who are outside the church. The world here means people who live out in the world and who are indifferent or angry with God. So the starting point of God's grace is the world, not the church. Jesus was born not in a synagogue or in the temple, but out in the world in a manger. And God will not forsake the world for the sake of the church. And as far as the church is involved in the mission of God in the world, then the grace of God is in the church. But in our time, people find the grace of God usually in the mission before they find it in the church. The world is like the football field. The church is like the locker room. The real game is not inside the locker room. The real game is out in the world, on the field. And we can only win the game out on the field, not in the locker room. The grace of God is on the field where the mission is. So if a church is not in, the real, in real mission in the world, then they may chance miss the grace of God. I invite you to discover the grace of God by playing the game out on the field in the world. It is on the field out in the world where God gives you the gift of grace and gives me the gift of grace so that God can grow us and help others to grow with us as well. And as you grow and heal yourself with God's grace, people around you will grow and heal with God's grace. Several years ago, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution reported in the newspaper the story of a Norcross waitress. She was a single mother with three children and the Gwinnett County Board of Commissioners had fined her $50 for leaving her garbage can out in the street too long. Now, not only did someone anonymously pay her fine at the courthouse, but so many people came to eat at the Waffle House where she was a waitress that she received $1,200 in tips on one Friday after that story appeared. 
word. <laughs> she was overwhelmed with this generosity, overwhelmed with this gift of grace that came to her from people she didn't even know. I see this story as an example of how God solves our garbage can problem, our sin problem. And God is generous toward all of us at one time or another, giving us great gifts, expressing God's love and grace in which we know in no way deserve, in which I in no way deserve. Behold, if you see your life as a gift from God, then it is not too difficult for you to see salvation as a gift from God by grace through faith. In this great passage, there are three spiritual realities. Here in this episode with Nicodemus, we find first of all the grace of God. God the Father loves you. God so loved the world that God gave. We see secondly, the compassion of Christ. God the Son loved you enough to die for you for your sins that you should be forgiven by God and restored to the kind of compassionate lifestyle that God wants us humans to practice. And three, there's a spiritual reality of the healing hope of the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit can recreate you and me through a new birth for eternal life with God. This is the true human life that is pleasing to God. Now, at the end of Jesus' life, after he dies on the cross, Nicodemus does seem to get it. Nicodemus apparently sees Jesus' death, and he comes to believe that Jesus is the truth about God. And so Nicodemus stepped forward out of the shadow of the night, and he helped Joseph of Arimathea bury the body of Jesus. After God lifts up the serpent on the pole, well, that we don't have the drawing, the uh, picture of the serpent on the pole, Moses, those who are wounded look on it and are healed. So I invite you this week to live in the grace of God, to live as God has lived with you, and to experience God's love and share that with others. May you experience the grace of God, the compassion of Christ, and the healing hope of the Holy Spirit this week. Amen.